some specifics. Just like there are houses on your street on the block in which you live, and everybody in those various houses, their families have different kinds of traditions. Some folk have family meals together. Some folk just gather around with TV trays in the, the TV room or the den or whatever you call it. And, uh, you know, folk do different things, and that's okay because it's their house. And it's okay that we do things different. Matter of fact, we do things intentionally different at Victory uh, for a specific reason. And that's, that's because uh, we are trying to target a different group of people than some of the other congregations are, are targeting. We specifically want to go after the unchurched people in Crittenden County. And that is a diverse group of folk. Uh, it's, it's a diverse age group. It's a diverse socioeconomic uh, collection of people. It's varied educational levels. Uh, it's varied ethnic and racial backgrounds. Uh, it's various religious persuasions uh, that have come from maybe their families were in church and they grew up this or that or the other. And, and so we, we bear all those things in mind. And we are particularly targeting, we are particularly wanting to make sure that we are always fresh and targeting the next generation. That doesn't mean we're ignoring the current one or the older generation. I'm proud to say that victory has five generations in it. Come on, somebody. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise. But if we don't stay active in pursuing the next generation and preparing them to be leaders, then we can turn around in one generation and we can die with a little tiny handful of blue-haired folk. And nothing wrong with that. Don't hear it the wrong way, but just little, little nothing but little gray heads. And it's sad to see congregations die like that. And they say, well, we want folk to come, but they're not willing to change anything because they're all driven by their preferences at, at a certain age. Well, I want it this way. Well, you know what? You're trying to reach folk that are 50 years younger than you, and they're not going to come for that. And so we, we intentionally do some things that, I'll be honest, they're not my preference. I mean, if my preference would be it would probably drive half of you out of here, and we'd gather a whole other group and... And that's not what it's about. We feel like we have a calling, and when we are part of something bigger than us, we're willing to lay down our individual preferences for the sake of accomplishing something greater for the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. We gathered in 2011, and we came up with five core values. And they go like this. We intentionally create an environment. Everybody say environment. We talked about this last Sunday. We just said, look, the hospitality, the friendliness, the grace, the love, the presence of the Lord that is in this room, those things didn't just happen accidentally. We intentionally, we have, we have taken steps to help folk recognize that uh, this is the place where you need to put a smile on your face and be friendly because there are guests that are coming in for their very first time and they're scared to walk in a new building and meet new people and the greatest thing we can do sometimes for the kingdom is put a smile on our face and stick out our hand and say welcome my name is Michael and so we intentionally create an environment that's the first one everybody say environment and they all start with E where we Number two, embrace diversity in our community. That's what I'm going to be talking about this morning, embrace. We embrace diversity in our community. The third one is we engage people with the life-giving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're gospel-driven. And then there's a transformation that's taken place in those people between three and four. Because in three, we engage people with the life-giving message of the gospel. The fourth one is we equip Christ followers. Something has happened. The gospel has penetrated a heart. We are not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1.16. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. It says, to everyone that believes... Herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That's verse 17. And so between 3 and 4, between hearing the gospel and equipping Christ followers, a transformation has taken place. Someone has made a decision to say, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Everybody say, be Lord. All right, so then once we begin to equip Christ followers, then our last one, our fifth one, is that we excel 
in maximizing our resources for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We want to help you discover your spiritual gifts, your natural abilities, your personality traits, who you are, the desires that God has placed in your heart, all of those different kinds of things that make you up as a unique individual, as the workmanship of God, call to good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. So we create an environment, we embrace diversity, we engage people with the gospel, we equip Christ followers, and we excel. We want a spirit of excellence. We excel in maximizing our resources, time, talent, treasure, gifts, finances, all of those things for the advancement of God's kingdom. Somebody say amen. Now, all this month through the first week of February, we'll be doing these. I've got it this Sunday. Pastor Jeremy will speak next Sunday on engaging folk with the gospel. Pastor Haley will be the next one on equipping Christ followers. I'll be back then on February the 4th and talk to you about excelling. The next Sunday, we're going to do a State of the Church address. All of our members are going to be getting in the mail a financial report, where we are, what's going on. And so if you're a member of Victory Church, then you'll be getting that in the mail. We'll be addressing. It's not just a financial meeting by any means, but we'll be talking about where we're heading. The Lord gave me a word whispered into my heart, and he said, I'm going to take you from survival to revival. Everybody say, from survival. Come on, say it. From survival to revival. And too many folk in this room have just been making it, just getting by, just, just existing, whether it's from paycheck to paycheck or it's just from, from, from Monday to Friday. God, I can't stand this job. God, I need a break. Lord, this marriage. Lord, these kids. God, help me. I mean, you know, when we live in survival mode, God says that's not the best that he desires for us. He wants us to move from survival to revival. So everything that we're going to be saying throughout the year is how to help us get out of survival mode into revival where we can thrive. All right? Somebody put your hands together and give the Lord praise. All right. That's my intro. This morning, the scripture, I'm going to use the classic Tim Tebow. It was already famous before he did it, but when he wore it under his eyes, it was the most Google Bible verse. Uh, in that football game, it, he had John 3.16 under his, on the black under his eyes. And the Bible says in the New Living Translation, find a screen. If you would, I want you to read it out loud with me, please. Here we go. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word and God's people said. Our one thing, say this with me, here we go. The church is called to demonstrate God's boundary crossing love in thought, word, and deed to all of creation. Now, that's pretty good. I know it's cold, and I know some of you braved it and got out here anyway. But give me, give me the, give me the Port of Ayarta laying on the beach vibe. Come on, here we go. Let's just let's fake it, faith it till we make it. Here we go. Say it like you really mean it. The church is called to demonstrate God's boundary-crossing love in thought, word, and deed to all of creation. Bow your hearts with me, please, for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together today in this place. Thank you for our nation. We pray that you move this country from survival to revival. We ask in Jesus' name for those in positions of authority from the local, state, and federal level that you would bring peace and quiet. Lord, calm. Lord, that you would establish order. We pray that you would give wisdom and grant an understanding of the the direction, Lord, that we're going. Father, that we would turn and turn our hearts and repent and seek your face. Call on your name. The word says that you would hear from heaven and heal our land, and we cry out to you for that. We ask you in this new year that you would show us individually how we can take steps to bring our families and our homes and our children, our parenting, our finances, our health Lord, our jobs, our careers, our influence in the community, bring it out of survival and move it into revival. We just pray today that, Holy Spirit, that you would move in our midst and do what only you can do. I ask you for clarity of my thought, and I ask you for brevity to, to say it uh, as succinctly as possible. 
And I pray that the name of Jesus would be glorified, that he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And everybody said, amen. Since in his name we pray. Point number one, God has an intention for your life, for mine. And God's intention for Israel wasn't merely to get them out of Egypt and into the promised land. But I believe that in Exodus 19, God spoke from a firework party. The mountain was belching out fire and smoke, and it looked ominous, it looked judgmental, but it was actually God declaring it to be their Independence Day from Egypt. It was the blood that was applied to the doorposts in Egypt. It was burial into water that brought them through the Red Sea and initiated them into the school of the wilderness. It was in the wilderness where they, I'm sorry, it was in Egypt where they celebrated Passover, the shedding of the blood and the partaking of eating the lamb. Jesus is the lamb for every house. He's the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. It was in Egypt where they celebrated the Passover. It was in the wilderness where they celebrated Pentecost. And Pentecost is the feast of the, the first ripe, the first fruits, the, the, the barley harvest, all those things that are first to emerge in the seed of the ground. And it's a, it's a, it's a great time of celebration of God declaring who they were. It was their Independence Day. And it was at that place in Exodus 19 where Moses speaks and says, The Lord said that we were to be a kingdom of priests. And when you hear the word kingdom, you think of royalty because the word king is in kingdom. And he says, You are to be a kingdom of priests. God wanted Israel to be the firstborn among the nations. They were not just to be this, this special, isolated God's elite above everybody else the way it turned out to be. But God desired that they would be a priestly nation to the other nations of the world because God has always had a worldwide vision. God has always had a worldwide dream. He didn't change his mind in John 3.16 when it said, For God so loved the whole world that he gave his uniquely begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God's vision from the beginning was worldwide. Everybody say worldwide. And so he wanted to use Israel to be a priestly nation to all of the other nations that they would represent God's will and his kingdom to the other nations of the world. Because when you read in the closing book of the scripture, the book of Revelation, we find God's tapestry. A people gathered around the throne out of every kindred, nation, tribe, and tongue. It's interesting that the word race is not in the Bible. Race is a human construct. And I want to remind you that there are kindreds, there are tribes, there are families, there are peoples and nations. This racial divide that we've had being fed by political influences in order to keep us separate and keep us angry and keep us enraged uh, is a work and a tactic of the enemy. If we can ever see, come on, if we can ever see that grace is greater than race, grace will swallow up race. The only answer to racial reconciliation it's not another governmental program, but it's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Recognizing that my brother, my sister, regardless of their skin color, that I'm to see them with the eyes of Jesus. And even as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, that the, his children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. God hastened the day that that is happening in America. Somebody say amen. God wanted a priestly nation, literally a firstborn among the nations was his intention for Israel. And they were scared and they rejected it. They said, no, we can't be a kingdom of priests. We can't be a nation, a national priesthood to the other nations of the world. And on that spot, God said, okay, you're not going to do what I'm asking you to do. Then in, in that moment, God chose the tribe of Levi 
to be the priestly tribe. His intention was to make a whole nation, a nation of priests to all the other nations of the world. But he said, okay, you're not going to do this then. And, you know, they 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 turned their back several times. They'd rejected the possibility of entering the promised land. Ten came back with evil reports in Numbers chapter 13. Two stood up and said, we're well able to take the land. And literally, the scripture says, God told them for every day that you spied the land, for every day you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until this whole generation dies out and I raise up another one that's born in the wilderness. They're the ones that are going to go in and possess the land. And that's what happened. We have to be careful about telling God what we're not willing to do. I don't believe that we can lose our salvation, but I believe we can certainly lose our inheritance and our destiny. Are you hearing me this morning? Come on. That's bumped over into the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 2. And Peter the Apostle says, you, everybody say you, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now he's not talking to Israel, he's talking to the church. You are a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness, who has, past tense, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Everybody say chosen generation. Come on, say it. Chosen generation. Say royal priesthood. Say holy nation. Peculiar people. So, so Peter is hearkening again back to Exodus 19. God's intention was to make Israel a priestly nation to the other nations of the world. And so now Peter says, guess what? What Israel, the nation, wouldn't do, the church will do. We're called to be a royal priesthood. Kings and priests. Kings and priests. Jesus was both of those, held both of those offices. Zechariah prophesies about Yeshua HaMashiach that is coming prior to his first advent. And it says, and he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. Everybody say, king, priest. Jesus is king, Jesus is priest. Now the problem is, a whole lot of folk want a priest that will pray for them and bless them, but they don't want no king. Because the king tells you what you do and what you don't do. The king, Jesus, is not just my priest who will pray for me and love me and comfort me and guide me, but he's my king who will say, uh-uh, we ain't having that in my kingdom. Come on, somebody, put your hands together and give the Lord praise. As a kingdom of priests, we are called to represent. We are representatives. And in representatives, represent the kingdom of God, the will of God, the image of God, Christ. We represent Christ to the world. Everybody say, represent. In other words, one we're doing it one more time. We're presenting all over again who Jesus is to the world. Point number two, in this message, embrace, call to love, Exclusion is not part of our job description. Exclusion is not part of our job description. Now, what happened to the Hebrew people is that they began to see themselves as the elite chosen and everybody else outside of that club were dogs. That's what Gentile means, heathen. They were looked down upon and literally called dogs because they didn't follow and didn't subscribe to the Torah, which is another word for the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, which, by the way, every faithful Jew had all five books memorized by the time they were adults. So they knew the word. They, they, were, they were built and established and founded on God's word, especially the, the five books of the law. Of God, the, Mos- the, the books that Moses wrote. And so this morning as I opened this up, because of the attitude that began to grow and emerge among the Hebrew people, that they were special and everybody else was dogs, there was a departure away from the heart that God had intended them to represent Him to the world. Are you following me this morning? Okay. Now, if there are some examples. Somebody says, well, you know, the Bible is clear. We're not supposed to have anything to do with those people. First of all, just saying it that way to me is offensive. Those people. There were years, there were years literally where the Bible, God's word was used to justify enslaving a race of people in 
the United States of America, and they twisted scripture and, and, and used it in order to say that this is a good thing, and we're actually helping them. We're helping to civilize them. It's a dark spot in our national history. And so I just want to tell you, be careful when we start mixing the word and forming our laws out of somebody's twisted version of of the word and the laws that have been established based on a, an improper interpretation of what God's word says. I want you to realize that it was not sinners that killed Jesus. It was a bunch of religious folk who got the law on their side. I just want to say to you today, I just want to remind you, yet it's the first of the year, you hadn't heard me mention it yet, but I want to tell you there's not a Democrat Jesus and there's not a Republican Jesus and if your view of God is more formulated by your politics, then you're worshiping an idol. Don't care which side, whether it's on the left side of the spectrum or the right side of the spectrum or whatever. When we let that creep into our understanding and we start putting on political glasses to look at the word, we have just raised up something that is not the image of God, but it's God made in the image that we choose to, and that's not the God of the Bible. Come on, somebody help me this morning. Don't care which side it is, and I'm not taking sides. Thank you, thank you. Somebody, somebody help me. My whole point is, we can't be a congregation that says we only want this group here, or we only want that group here, and all the everybody else is y'all are the devil. It's like that crazy woman in The Water Boy. <laughs> Foosball, the devil. Republicans are the devil. Democrats are the devil. And, and this demonization that's going on, this, this dividing line that is here, this, and it's been for years, and it's, it's white against black, and it's rich against poor, and it's, and it's impoverished against the, the wealthy and the privileged, and it's educated against the ignorant, and back and forth, and everybody's got this dividing line. And there's one place where we can't let that exist, and that is in the church of Jesus Christ. We are called to be a people who embrace and we're called to love. Let me give you some examples. Point number two, exclusion is not part of our job description in the church. Remember the curse of the Moabites. Remember their history? Genesis chapter 19, Sodom and Gomorrah has been destroyed and Lot and his family have left and his wife has died. She disobeyed the word of the Lord and turned back and became a pillar of salt. And the two daughters figure there's no chance for them to carry on the family name. And they get their daddy drunk. This is gross. It's in the Bible. I'm not, I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. But they got their father drunk. And they both those daughters had sexual relations, an incestuous relationship with their father Lot. And Moab and Ben-Ami was born. And it became two radical enemies against the people of God. The Moabites and the Ammonites. It's a gross story to even tell. That's the beauty I love about the Bible. It doesn't leave out the stuff, the uncomfortable parts. And there was a curse on the Moabites because later that group of people become a whole tribe and, and they're growing and they even have their own king. And, 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 and Balak is the king of the Moabites and he tries to hire the prophet Balaam and he brings him in. He takes him up to the top of the mountain and the children of Israel are camping out there in the valley. And literally you can see the 12 tribes, three to the north and three to the south and three to the east and three to the west and the tabernacle in the middle. And it's literally a blazing camp in the shape of a cross in the wilderness. And Balak takes Balaam up on the mountain. He says, pronounce a curse on these people. They're enemies of us. And, and ba Balaam gets anointed by the presence of God and he can't curse them. He ends up pronouncing a blessing. And because one more incident occurred, the scripture says in Deuteronomy 23, that they're not to dwell among the Moabites. They're not to even associate with the Moabites. There was a curse on being a Moabite. The Bible is clear. Don't let Moabites come until God taps a little lady by the name of Ruth the Moabitess on the shoulder one day. Oh, 
whole book of the Bible is written about a Moabitess woman. The Bible is clear. Moabites are cursed. God says, no, I got something up my sleeve. And he sends Ruth along and she meets Boaz, who is an Old Testament type of Jesus Christ. And one day, Ruth is out working in the fields like a hired hand. And the next thing you know, Ruth is married to Boaz and she owns the field. She's no longer Ruth the Moabitess, but now she's the wife of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, and she's the great-grandmother of David. And this Moabitess who is cursed is listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. talking about offending the church lady right there. Y'all remember the church lady from Saturday Night Live? Oh, y'all are probably too spiritual to ever watch Saturday Night Live. Yeah, I'm the crazy preacher that sets up at 1030. And and that's so special. That's right. (laughs) Everybody say, Ruth! Come on. How about Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman? She was a dog. She was a Gentile. Jesus got a healing ministry going on. And this this alien, this immigrant, this crossed the border illegally. I'm not trying to get political with you any kind of way. You know what? If they're here, my God, let's share the gospel with them. Somebody help me. I got four or five people that can see my my spirit here. I, I believe we ought to have a secure border. Don't, don't, don't send me an email this week. I will reject it and send it back to you. We ought to have a secure border. I believe that. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. But even that's not more important than sharing the gospel with another human. Are y'all following me? Embrace. We are called to love. We're called to embrace diversity in our community. Because this is where we are called to minister. It's not just to build a nice white church. Don't want a white church. Don't want a black church. Don't want a brown church. Don't want a red church or a yellow church. I want the church. Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. I'm not going to turn there. I'm just going to tell these stories this morning. Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus. Will you please heal my child? And Jesus does something that is shocking. It is a shocking reading Because I know his love and I believe he was intentionally trying to mirror the attitude of Israel to the other nations around them. And he says, it's not good to take the meat that belongs to the children and throw it to the dogs. He called her a dog. And you know what? She didn't get offended. You know, you you, you got an all-black meeting going and I walk in and you refer to the cracker in the back. You got, a, you got a white group together, and my God help us, you use the N-word? Or we come up with, uh, we, uh, we, we look at a Mexican and call him a wet back because they're swimming across the Rio Grande. Or whatever kind of disparaging remark. Let me just say this. Wherever, whoever you are, think of the thing that would offend you the most. He looked at her and called her a dog, but she didn't blink for a second. She said, yes, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And let me tell you what that story is hearkening back to. It goes back to the two original spies that came back with a good report. One whose name was Joshua, which is another name for Jesus. And the other one was Caleb or Caleb, which is a non-Hebrew word. He was a Kenizzite. He wasn't an Israelite. But oh, he had something on him that Joshua liked to have with him. He he was hanging out with God's man, Joshua. And Caleb literally means dog. Everybody let your neighbor say, bow wow. Because when it came time to get into the the promised land, Caleb was 80 years old. And he said, I'm not too old. I've still got the strength of the young man. And give me the promise that was given to me. And the scripture says that he was given the outer, the extended portion on the edges. Because he was not a Jew. He was not a Hebrew. He was not an Israelite. So he was able to inherit the outer portion, the edge of the table, so to speak. He was able to possess that edge so that there was always an open door for folk who weren't Jews who could come in and be received. Come on, somebody. 
Literally, Jesus looked at her and he said, Woman, I haven't found so much faith in all of Israel. Do you know that every time Jesus talked about the faith of his people, he talked about how little they had. He never bragged on the, the faith level of an Israelite. He said, I come to you, brooding over you, reaching out to you, and you won't have it. But a Roman centurion comes to Jesus one day, a Gentile. Everybody say a dog. Everybody say bow wow. A Roman centurion says, I've got a sick servant, but you don't even need to take your time and go with me to lay your hands on him. But if you will just speak the word, I'm a man in authority and a man under authority, and I tell men to go, and they go, and I'm told to go and come, and I know what authority is. And Jesus said, I have never found so great a faith in all of Israel. What is my point? You don't have to be in the born right club to have something that will get the attention of Jesus. You don't have to be born white or born rich or born black or born, in, or born whatever. You just need to be born again. It ain't good to take this and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yeah, that's right, but even the dogs get the crumbs. They're referring back to Caleb, who inherited the edge of Israel, the edge of the master's table. And then we've got a story. I got one more. You got y'all get anything out of this this morning? I tell you, I feel so good. I believe who needs to be here is here. And those of you might be listening to it on, on our streaming this morning or maybe later on YouTube. And if I offend you, please just open your heart and let God deal with you. Let him help you. It's not the job of the church to exclude anybody. Red, yellow, black, white, rich, poor. Educated, uneducated, gay, straight. Yeah, I included that too. If we're going to limit who can get in the door, we've just prevented anyone from being able to hear the gospel and God to do a work that can change and transform their lives. Everybody knows the Bible says that eunuchs are cursed. You know who eunuchs are? Eunuchs, Jesus says there's some that have been made eunuchs by men and some that are eunuchs themselves for the sake of the kingdom. A eunuch is a man who's been castrated. I mean, it wasn't bad enough you had to talk about incest, Pastor. Now you're going to get real, going to get real weird on us. It's in, it's in the Bible. Eunuchs, everybody knows that, that eunuchs are cursed, don't have anything to do with them. Yet, in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, a eunuch who is literally the fiduciary of Queen Candace from Ethiopia is sent, and he's hungry, he's thirsting, he's got a God hunger moving in him. And he meets Philip, and Philip opens the book of Isaiah and begins to speak to him and shares the gospel, and he has a transformative experience, and Philip takes him and baptizes him, and he's immediately received, arms thrown around him in the church of Jesus Christ. He goes back to Ethiopia and starts the oldest representation of Christianity on the planet, and that's the Ethiopian Coptic church. By a dude who, who anyway... I'm telling you, whatever comes through that door. If you got anything in you that's an inversion of, I don't care if their hair is purple and they're, they're pierced 143 times. Are you listening to me this morning? I don't care. What, listen, I, I, when you see that there is a group that is outcast in the Bible, just hang on because God's always going to make a move to pour out his spirit among that group. It is not the job of the church to do the exclusion. Somebody say amen. Are you getting anything out of this? The church is called to demonstrate God's boundary-crossing love in thought, word, and deed to all of creation. Point number three, and I'm finished. Victory is sent to the Mid-South. See, we've got this Americanized cultural Christianity idea that we are, we're American and we're Christians and we like baseball and drive a Chevy and we love apple pie and so therefore we're Christian. And that's so 
freaking far from the truth. Pardon me. It's just not even, not even anywhere near the Scripture. And to recognize that as the church, as the ecclesia, called out to lead is what the Greek word means. Ecclesia. We get the word ecclesiastic from it. We get, we get ecclesiastical, which speaks of church leadership. Ecclesia, we are the called out, called out of darkness into his marvelous light, called out of hatred into the demonstration of God's love and thought, word, and deed to all of creation. His boundary crossing love. We are sent. You have a mission. You're apostello. You are apostolic in that sense. We are an apostolic church. I don't mean in the denominational sense, but I mean that we are the sent people of God. We have been sent to the Delta. We are sent to Marion. I know it's cold outside and y'all are about half awake, but I, ooh, I feel so good preaching this. I ain't going to let up. <laughs> Victory is sent to the Mid-South. We all know what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But look at what 1 John 3.16 says. I think this is so cool. I don't think it's a coincidence. In John 3.16, Jesus gave His life for us. But 1 John 3.16, read it out loud with me please. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up His life for us. Here we go. So we also ought... To give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Oh man, we can preach John 3.16 all day, but don't ask me to sacrifice anything. Don't ask me to throw my arms around that homeless person that hadn't had a bath in a month. Don't ask me to be sweet to that purple-haired, tattooed, whole body, inked up, jacked up freak that just walked in here. Yeah, that's the kind of the words people use. And if we think those things, God help us. God help us in our stupidity and our ignorance. His judgment is already on us and we don't even realize it. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Yeah, but that's my brother and sister. My brother and sister are those who think like me and look like me and act like me and talk like me and live where I live and and do what I do and choose what I choose. No. 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 See, that's how Old Testament Israel thought. Love your neighbor. And your neighbor were all of your other Jewish brothers and sisters. And, God, and Jesus came and turned that whole ethic on its head. And he said, oh, you know what? Anybody, even the Gentiles, can love somebody who loves them back. He says, I'm telling you, don't just love your brothers and sisters, but love your enemies. Oh, you mean i got to love those fools up there on Capitol Hill that destroy in this country? We are stuck in such disgusting echo chambers. We listen to the same stuff by our favorite news network and we get it on social media and we're trapped in an algorithm in a box that keeps sending us the same BS and I don't mean Bible study. I am preaching this morning. I'm telling you the honest to God truth. And somewhere we as the church have got to wake up Vote your convictions. I don't care which side of the aisle it's on. But my God, when it comes to being a Christian, it has nothing to do with that stuff. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us, so we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Some of you in here this morning ain't got... You you ain't got a snowball's chance in hell of a right to be throwing a stone at anybody because I remember what some of you got delivered from. Maybe you forgot. Don't get all high and mighty and all self-righteous. Don't, don't, you know what? You are not who you used to be and you're not yet what you're going to be, but don't forget where he brought you from. Come on, somebody. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Ain't nothing anybody in this room done that's so awful that God won't pour out His love for you and turn to you if you will turn to Him. Come on! As a matter of fact, I won't even predicate it on you turning to Him because you can't even feel it unless He turns to you first and then you turn to Him and then He just dumps it on you and baptizes you with His love. 
our mission field, we, we know the Great Commission in, at the close of every one of the Gospels, but especially the one in Matthew, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. Literally, it's the present progressive in the Greek. It says it this way. And for too long, we've gotten this idea that go into all the world means have a fundraiser and get a team and go to Africa. That's not what it means. It's not, it's not go somewhere and take a convenience picture you're going to put up on social media with a brown-skinned child that you wouldn't walk across the street to help if it were at home. I'm trying. Help us, Lord. Help us, Jesus. It doesn't mean gather up a bunch of money and go to the islands, gather up a bunch of money and go to South America, it means as you are going into your world, present progressive, as you are going into the, as you get up and go to work tomorrow, well, maybe if the weather comes in, you might not go, okay? As you're going to your school, as you are going to the bank, as you are going into the world, as you do your business and trade, you represent Christ to the world. And God loved that unlovable person so much that he says nothing can separate them from the love of God. But we can. We can. We can get an attitude and we can think, well, you know, now I don't, I'm not going to have anything to do with that family because, you know, that's that family of folk whose the daughters got the daddy drunk and had babies. You know how folk gossip. Well, you know, that's that, that's that group. That's that, that's that family. That's that tribe. How about we just let God be the judge? Now, I'm not telling you to suspend your discernment. If you're around somebody that's crooked and you sense it, keep your distance. Be wise. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Yeah, but pastor, you know the Bible says he's going to separate the sheep from them goats. You know what you need to do? Just make sure you ain't a goat. And you know what? If you're not, quit acting like one. You know what a goat does? But, 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 but. You try to present faith in the will of God, and you, yeah, but, but. That's a goat just butting all the time. I thought that was a pretty good line. Make sure you're not one. That one, I woke up and popped my eyes open this morning, and I said, yeah, that's good. Y'all didn't, y'all didn't like it nearly as good as it was. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Let God decide who the sheep and who the goats are. Just make sure you're not one of them goats. The church is called to demonstrate God's boundary-crossing love in thought, word, and deed to all of creation. You know, those are just a couple of stories. I, the Bible is full of them. The Israelites hated the Samaritans. Jesus showed up at a well one day, and he spent half the afternoon talking to a woman who'd been married five times. Living shacked up with a sixth one. Y'all hearing me? Israelites hated Samaritans. But Jesus stopped to share some love he had a boundary-crossing love. Everybody around him said, don't you know who, what she is? And he said, oh, I'm fully aware. And I see the spirit that's in you too. And he stood there and he shared the word. And she went away from there. The first woman evangelist, come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. She was transformed. She was transformed. We can't let ourselves hate any group of people. I, I, was, I was with family over Christmas and we had some friends there too and somebody said something about Nancy Pelosi. I hate that and they used a word they shouldn't use and I just stopped. I said, are you serious? Really? I, I don't like some of the stuff she does or stands for, but really? You're going to spend your energy hating somebody you're not ever going to see? Really? Do you realize how you have been sucked in to a media frenzy about somebody you don't even know I don't I don't like her politics but I don't hate Nancy Pelosi 
You know what? Whether you like to hear this or not, Nancy Pelosi has the image of God, even though it's broken, just like it was in you, in me and you when we came to Christ. Jesus loves even. Are you all hearing me this morning? God, I'm trying to help some people in this room this morning. Come on, we've got this all John Wayne kind of faith going on these days. and We just need to take a back up and read the red words that are in our Bibles and realize how Jesus didn't act like a jackass with people. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm finishing this. I'm going to get out of here before I say something I have to apologize for. Are y'all hearing me this morning? We are in called to embrace, to love people with a boundary-crossing love. That means you know something about somebody who walks in the door. You don't judge them. You don't look down on them. You, you know, you may not, you may have an issue and you can't actually go and extend your hand and give them a hug. But you know what you ought to do? You ought to go, oh, wow, this is an opportunity for God to do something in that person's life. Wow. Because I believe if he can do it anywhere, I believe he can do it in Victory Church. Come on, somebody. That's the kind, Come put your hands together. That's the kind of church. God wants us to have. Would you stand to your feet with me, please, this morning? Heavenly Father, we pray. We pray that you forgive us for how we have been so sucked in to the spirit of this age, the spirit of division, just demonizing everybody else who is not like us. And Lord, I know there's right and wrong. I'm not blurring those lines. Help us, Father. Help us, Lord, to see that love is bigger than politics. Love is bigger than all of this media creation that's going on all around us. Help us to fall in love with Jesus, to love Jesus, and to love like Jesus. Forgive us when we've made an image and we've bowed down in front of it, and it's been Jesus in our own image. Lord, we ask you, we make a fresh commitment right now as we close this service today in this beginning of this new year that we will embrace diversity. We will love people right where they are. We'll throw our arms around them. We'll love on them. Lord, in all of their unfinished junk in their lives because, Lord, you loved us the same way. You still love us. You're still working on us. You're not finished yet, but thank God that you're working on us. Help us to represent, to be a priestly nation, to be the royal priesthood in Delta, in the Mid-South that you've called us to be. If that's you this morning and you would just say, Father, help me, I want you to pray this with me right now. Say it out loud. Father, I hear this word. My heart is convicted. Change me. Convict me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me love Jesus and let me love like Jesus. I am sent to this area. I'm called of God to represent Jesus to the Delta. Go with us, oh God, today I pray in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said. Amen. Continue standing. We've got a song. I would like if the, the prayer ministries would come. There may be someone who has another issue that you'd like to have lifted up or prayed for as we close this service this morning.